Back it's in the day, real- they used to spike underground growth hormone with anti-diuretic to make you hold more water to make you think your GH is more potent. So that's another yeah. practice in the com- the underground community when they make peptides. You're talking about IGF one um, and growth hormone. Um, I think it. it I'm curious to your thoughts on, you know, I, uh, on peptides, you know, that, so right now there's a huge surge in the number of people that are interested in peptides because it sounds not as uh, yeah. perhaps scary to them as it does hormone augmentation again. And I, I, I really, um, you know, I, I don't think that people should run out and start tinkering with their endocrinology. I mean, you need to work with a physician if you're going to do that at all. And ideally it's because there's a real clinical need, but, but peptides are interesting because there are a couple issues that, um, come to mind. One is, um, so I've seen examples of people who take things like sermorelin, tesamorelin, ipamorelin in order to get some more growth hormone release uh, in sleep and end up with um, doubling or even tripling of their prostate specific antigen. Have you heard about this? Uh, um, is that just that? Yeah, I heard it from you specifically. And I remember uh, I, pro- I probably wrote it on like a topic list to dive into more, but I don't know what would cause that specifically, although I do know the function by which a lot of these peptides work is through agonism of the ghrelin receptor, which has interactions, significant interactions with stress as well. So it's not just about, I think a lot of people, they think you take this peptide and all of a sudden your pituitary just like spits out more GH or something. But in reality, it's stimulating a receptor that is designed to make you hungry. And in rodents, it's actually something they chronically agonize to induce PTSD which is like kind of sketchy when you think about, I'm not saying you shouldn't use peptides by the way, but in general, like some of them, like the, the ones that are more chronic around the clock and aren't like pulsatile in nature. Like there's this one called, um, ibutamoran MK677 and it's, um, highly, you know, advantageous because it's orally administered. It's very bioavailable. It works on like a 24 hour, like cycle, essentially, like you can actually maintain your IGF one for, upwards of 24 hours and get it from like a deficient state up to the top end of the reference range. But it's very potent at agonizing this ghrelin receptor, which not only makes you ridiculously hungry and you end up eating way more than you should, which is obviously, you know, not great for some individuals, especially like fitness individuals that don't want to, you know, overeat in general. But as a consequence of that, there seems to be some interaction with like a high stress response, which I don't know if downstream that has something to do with, like, I don't see it in my head. I can't piece together why that would downstream lead to a spike in PSA, given that you're dealing with GH downstream leading to growth factor production as a consequence of making you very, very hungry and stressed out potentially. I don't see where that would interplay at all, but just notable nonetheless that that is like the receptor that is responsible for actually stimulating your body to make that growth hormone. It's not just like, pituitary make growth hormone there's like you know like precursor things that have to happen first so mm-hmm. the very interesting well the um the, the one of the things that i find interesting about sermorelin and and ipromorelin is that uh and tessamorelin in particular is that it seems that they can change uh gene expression in the hypothalamus such that if people uh are using them for short periods of time, three days or so, and then taking some days off that they, the effects tend to linger. And so I think, well, you know, what, one of the reasons for bringing this up is that um, I've heard uh, that out there, the, the peptides, some of them are contaminated with lipopolysaccharide with LPS mm-hmm. in laboratory, we inject LPS in order to study fever, to induce fever. It's a, it's called a pyrogen uh, because it, it increases fever. So it's a experimental tool. Back it's in the day, a, they used to spike underground growth hormone with anti-diuretic to make you hold more water, to make you think your GH is more potent. So that's another yeah. practice in the, com- the underground community when they make peptides. But anyway. Just worth mentioning. Yeah, I know it, it, it's, it's really important to bring this up. But, you know, I think that um, the, the the peptide thing is is a, is a really uh, barbed wire topic because um, there are many sources, and yet that the how clean those sources are is it's really variable. There are sources, there are compounding labs that work with physicians, and I think yeah, that's. Yeah. That's ultimately, and those, I, as, as far as I understand, are, are producing essentially what they say they are and cleaning out the LPS. But the lipopolysaccharide 
it's it's not something that you want going into your body chronically. That's that's not going to be a good situation. But no, you know. even like synthetic carrier oils and stuff and underground gear, like a lot of people think, why would I spend more money on a compounded testosterone for my TRT when I can just buy underground gear that it's not very cheap to make testosterone. Or it's not very expensive to make testosterone. It's very easy to get relatively accurately dosed testosterone. But it's like the way these like you know bathtub chemists, obviously some better than others, but Sometimes they'll make these kind of compounds in a way that's extra, like it'll spike your C-reactive protein from like 0.3 up to like 40, you know, like it's crazy. And it's like, you don't actually think about that stuff or even realize it because you probably don't even check your blood work, let alone your C-reactive protein in your blood work. But that's the kind of stuff that differentiates pharma from underground in some cases. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see the manifestations of some like really weird aberrations in your blood work when you take underground peptides, unfortunately. Yeah, well, elevated C-reactive protein, as as you know, is is terrible. It's it's gonna. I mean, it puts people at risk for macular degeneration. And you know, to this at least to this point in human history, we don't have a way to regenerate the retina once it's gone. So that's bad. Heart health, etc. Yeah, I think this is again where you know the reason why I'm a big believer in people getting blood work, not necessarily doing anything about altering their endocrinology, except you know, really mastering the lifestyle factors. It always, I think some people think it's, it sounds boring, but you know, if you get those lifestyle factors, right, you can get a lot out of that. And you, looking at the long arc of how to do things. I mean, I think that, uh, and then working with, with a, with a board certified MD is far and away the best way to do, to do things. Um, because they know a lot. I mean, one of the wonderful things that medical doctors have is a very extensive training and they understand they have that firsthand experience of working with people of a variety of backgrounds. So I think, uh, yeah, Kyle's excellent. There are other excellent people out there too, of course. But um, yeah, I think that, I think that you and I uh, very much see eye to eye on this. Yeah. As far as like, so you mentioned how you're sort of like a hyper responder to certain supplements and stimulants, presumably. Um, did you find a similar outcome with testosterone? Cause I know recently you've publicly come out and talked about how you're on TRT now where you, do you just have like a crazy spike in libido that was like overwhelming and it was like making you unproductive or crazy increases in gym performance or were you a hyper responder to tea or what happened with that? 